Buenos dias. It is wonderful to be with all of you here today. Um, so the subject of my presentation, and it's, I think I can see people. There's a light. When you're up on stage here, you don't know that the light is right in your face. So I'm going to try to peek out here every so often. So the subject of my presentation is blockchain. Blockchain, cryptocurrency, which I'm sure most people here in this room have heard something about whether it was Bitcoin, Ethereum, some friends of yours who tried to convince you that it was worth buying some, a token you heard about, maybe even a project that was related to supporting journalism. So I've spent the past year on something of a journey. Uh, and I'm here to share with you what I have learned in the past year about blockchain, trust, journalism, and consumers. So, a little bit about me here. I'm currently between contracts, which is what my dad says when he's unemployed. That's sort of another way to think about it. Um, so, let's talk about what is, what is trust? What does trust look like in the digital age? You know, we are still, I think everybody in this room is a human. I know we've been talking about bots and about technology, and about automated processes, about efficiency, optimization. As somebody who worked at Google for several years, I deeply understand and appreciate these concepts and the importance that they have in the ecosystem of how anybody consumes technology. Human beings are wonderful at all kinds of things, and I would argue that we should continue to give ourselves that credit as human beings meaning we can have substantive conversations with each other. You don't actually need a bot for that, just as a reminder. You could find a friend, a loved one, a colleague. You don't have to go to a bot, I hope. <laughs> but yes, they can, of course, make all sorts of interactions more interesting, faster. You can get information in ways you couldn't before. Blockchain and the idea of it is about distributing trust. So I'm going to try to break down some of the terminology that people might hear when they think about blockchain or cryptocurrency and, and all of these buzzwords and everybody gets caught up in the technical aspects of it. And I, I know and I, well, I, su I suspect that a lot of you here in this room are focused on technology. You're developers. You think about sort of the cutting edge of all of this. And as a reporter who covered science and technology my entire career for 20 years, that's how I thought, too. Look ahead, the future, what's next, what's out there, what's innovative? So blockchain speaks to people in journalism, I think, because of its focus on trust. And if everybody who's attached to journalism is worried about trust, if that's the core issue of what we're talking about, trust, do our readers trust us? Do we trust the sources we're talking to? Do we trust the institutions that are talking to us about whatever it is that they're doing? Do we trust the centralized entities like Google or Facebook or Twitter or whoever to put our best interests ahead of profits and money and revenue and growing a user base? What about us? What about what matters to us, right? Speaking now as everybody in this room, we're all a citizen of the world, we're all consuming news, we want what? The truth. So how do you get to the truth? How do you trust anybody, anybody in this room? Does blockchain solve trust? I'm going to leave that as a thought bubble right up here, and I would like all of you to just think about that. I have my own thoughts on it. I have some things I'm going to share with you to help kind of just get you thinking about what it means and how it works, but just leave that in your head for just a second. Okay, what do all the terms mean? What is this all about? Why do we have to learn a new language? Because that's what I've been doing for the past year. Remember how I said I can't speak Spanish or French? I can barely speak English. So now I'm trying to learn how to speak blockchain, which is an entirely other language of terms and concepts and ideas. So I'm not gonna go through all of these because this isn't a, a lesson Okay, this is me sharing what I learned. But there are terms out there that really can be simplified in ways that I don't think that many people get an opportunity to consume. So blockchain is just a bunch of computers, <laughs> okay, all talking to each other 
in different ways, trying to verify information. And, and when Aaron's talking about identity and, and, and trying to create a database, a trusted database of journalists, right? I think that blockchain actually has a fantastic potential application for something like that. Because we're talking about permanence in blockchain, we're talking about a unique identity, and we're talking about something that could potentially travel with you through the web in lots of interesting ways. So I'm not gonna, you know, I love what Aaron is up to with PressPass, but just as a way to think about what does this mean? Decentralized, distributed, right. So if you think about Google or Facebook or Twitter or any other central, banks, right? Take any centralized entity. They have centralized servers that all of our data runs through. Brrr, runs through it, they use it for whatever they need, they send you a newsletter, they ask you to get the latest, uh, you know, uh, special bank account that gives you a discount on your checking, uh, you know, your checks that you write or something, or your fees. Okay, so they know a little bit about us and we're okay with that because they have our money, right? Right? They have our money, actually. They have our money. Is everyone aware of that? The banks have your money. Okay, so you're trusting a bank. I don't know, what do I know about Chase Bank? Okay, that's my bank, Chase. Do I know anybody there personally? No, actually. Do I interact with them in any meaningful way other than a chat bot or a phone call to try to tell them that I was coming to Argentina? So they had to change my profile so I could use my credit card, my bank card. Okay, that's it. But I've given them all my money. Wow, that's kind of amazing, right? I don't know, just as a thought, as you think about who you trust and why, all of your money is in your bank, all of it. So if people are unsure of how to trust a news organization or journalists, I think we have some work to do, right? What are the questions that people have from both sides of this coin? Journalists have questions about how do I instill trust? Trust is it about more credibility indicators? Is it a more is it more about uh, more about showing you that all of my work is right here? Transparency. Look, here's everything I did. Look, here's my notebook. Do you want to come with me, Harkin? Do you want to come with me and tell the story? Can I show you everything? What else do you want to know? Here are the people I talked to. Do you want to hear the recording from the interviews I did? I don't know. Like, what will help you to trust whatever I share with you? How transparent does a journalist have to be in this day and age with the truth? If it's the truth, then you shouldn't have to worry, in my opinion, so much about transparency. I'm sorry I'm being a little bit provocative here this morning. But the point is that the truth is ultimately what matters. And if everybody in this room who's a journalist, who's practicing a practicing journalist, it's all I've ever known as a career. I was the editor of my high school yearbook went on to everything else, okay? If you know the truth, you, each person here, not your editors, not the readers, not the people commenting on the stories, you, if you know the truth, shouldn't that be enough? I'm just asking, okay? I'm asking, just asking these questions. So then you have citizens, people out there, who are journalists, right? Going back to press pass, who are they? You know, what are their motivations? Are they writing, the, are you writing these stories to try to stir up trouble? Journalists, right? Opinions, thoughts, ideas, stuff people don't like to hear, right? Remember the truth? Remember that expression, the truth hurts, the truth matters? Sometimes people don't like to hear the truth. But that doesn't mean that journalists or we should shy away from telling the truth, period. Sorry, <laughs> okay. So what is blockchain good for when it comes to journalism? So I mentioned identity. Governance, tokens, okay? As you leave here today, and if you're interested in blockchain and cryptocurrency, and by the way, this isn't going away, in my opinion, it's not a trend, okay? This is a reaction to how the web has a centralized, or the web was very distributed in the beginning, but then evolved to become much more centralized, and I think this is a bit of a course correction for what's happened for everybody. So governance, this is about putting tokens, votes, your voice into the hands of you all, citizens, people. What matters? What if you had a token, a vote, and you could vote on some aspect of journalism? I don't know exactly what it is. I don't have all the answers, to be clear. 
but just thinking about what if you could create a vote, an, a, 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 a vote that is attached to you, your identity, your voice. Okay. Storage. The idea of blockchain and distributed networks is that because there are vast numbers of computers in blockchain networks, the information is distributed across all of them eventually, meaning that it's like trying to get rid of every copy of the newspaper. If you tried to get every copy of La Nacion that went out today and tried to remove every single one of them, could you do it? No, of course not. So same idea with blockchain. That's what permanence is about. That's the idea that the content is immutable, cannot be altered or changed. And I think that adds a lot to transparency, if that's what we're interested in, where you can see updates, a log, what's the latest version of the story, did we make a correction? Can we push that content to the blockchain? That doesn't mean that everybody can see it all the time. It just means that it's there. So the UX in all of this for designers out there needs a ton of work. So please help <laughs> on that. Licensing, syndication, blockchain also offers an opportunity to fingerprint digital assets. So one of the biggest challenges for content creators, especially at scale, if you think about a wire service, is equitable monetization for creative content. I used to be a journalist, I was, and I was a freelancer, and I was, for, for a time in my career, I was a freelancer. And I always worried about, where did my content end up? Did somebody use this and I didn't get paid for it somewhere? And inevitably, I'd get like a Google alert notification that something that I'd written or something would appear on somebody else's site or a photo I came across, and I was always so annoyed. I had a good friend at Google when I worked there, Nick Whitaker. Some of you might know him, he's been here before, I think. And he's a photographer. And it, was, it would ki just kill him to no end that his photos would appear on some silly, cheesy business site or something he never intended them for because he also was a journalist before he joined Google. Okay, so licensing, syndication, curation. The idea that people could be incentivized through crypto economics to curate great quality journalism to share with people. This is something that Mark Little and Anya Kerr are working on. It's called Neva Labs and the idea that people will become ethical curators and think about your time and what you're interested in and work with news organizations to do that. Membership models is a bit of a, a, bit of a leap, but thinking about the idea that if you could incentivize people to become a member, so what, when we were listening earlier to Emily talk about the membership puzzle project, I says there's a question now, are there ways that cryptocurrency and blockchain could incentivize people to participate in any membership opportunity? I don't know, maybe. And identity, we've over already covered when um, Aaron was up here. So what is this whole space about blockchain and cryptocurrency? Is it a little scary out there? Are there you know, enough skeptics in the room? I'll tell you what, when I started this journey a year ago, you know, as somebody who's been in journalism for a long time, I have a healthy degree of skepticism. I am from Canada originally, so the optimism part often wins out. But I have a huge amount of skepticism when I hear things. That said, when I started to think about blockchain in a year ago, I got all excited and enamored and, gosh, it could be this utopian future and it solves all kinds of things. Why wouldn't I want to just jump right in? Well, it turns out that those guys with the guns and people maybe you don't, not sure if you trust, they're still there. And their motivations are not entirely clear, necessarily. And they're a little bit new to the game of journalism. So maybe they need some help in just navigating this stuff. And maybe we all need to have our antenna up. And remember that this is not a perfect space. There's an expression, garbage in, garbage out. Same thing with blockchain, OK? A big database. Put a bunch of shit in there, you get a bunch of shit out. Now, there are going to be regulators coming into this space. In the US, that's about the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. Can't get here fast enough. When will the sheriffs get in town? Where are the sheriffs, right? Blockchain, cryptocurrency, we all know there have been some stories of some pretty terrible stuff. People losing their money. Remember your money that you trusted to people? So just I'm going to just mention a couple of blockchain-based organizations that are thinking about journalism. Poet being one, they're based in New York. They're thinking about that idea of licensing and syndication and trying to build a new database of content that can be properly and equitably monetized. Fascinating stuff. Proof, they're thinking about ways that cryptocurrency can incentivize people to help tackle misinformation. And they've got some really neat ideas on it. 
And what about the money? Remember the money part? Remember your money? Where does the money come to, from to fund all this stuff? All these new projects in blockchain and cryptocurrency, okay? VCs, people with deep pockets in the cryptocurrency community. What is their motivation, I ask myself sometimes. So I'm gonna wrap up here with just a couple, of, a couple more thought bubbles. When you think about pursuing any new technology, any, as the person coming from the science and technology world, kind of sort of trying to be the guy from the future, <laughs> not always having the best time, but learning, ask yourself why. Simon Sinek, one of my leadership gurus, start with why. Why do you need any new technology? If you can't answer that question to your own personal satisfaction, then you shouldn't be doing it. So here are the, I don't know, just kind of a little bit of a crystal ball, right? Again, I don't have all the answers. I don't know what's gonna happen. I can't predict the future any more than anybody else, even though I love to spend time in it or tell myself that I'm in it. But think about some of these questions and some of the points that I'm illustrating to you. Aside from money, which we all have placed a great emphasis on, perhaps the most priceless and valuable commodity that exists in the world today that none of us have enough of and we can never seem to get more is time. So thank you all for your time here this morning and muchas gracias.